preventing, uh, so I use some AIS distribution and ecology in the context of prevention and then also kind of get a different way to think about prevention than we classically do. Yep. <laughs> so as you can see, we've got a cartoon here and uh, <laughs> some monster rusty crayfish. Yes, sir. Now the second. Now there's no port on the other side. Oh wait, there it is. Okay. All right, try it now. Eric, you want to just come up and give your talk now? <laughs> <laughs> right, there we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Sweet. All right, let's get started. Okay. So, steps for invasion. We know invasive species just don't show up in a lake. There's a, they go through a stepwise process when they go from one uh, lake to the next lake. First, you know, they need to arrive to the water body and survive that transit condition, get to that water body and survive the conditions of the new lake that they're in, either through temperature or oxygen or pH or um, biotic factors, grow and reproduce to, to a level where they can start um, exerting negative impacts on native flora and fauna. Pretty much just a basic spread idea. So the same arrive, survive, grow, reproduce, and dominate fits pretty well with the classic invasion curve. I know a lot of you guys have seen it, but if not, uh, as what we have here is as time increases and the area infested in a leak increases, or the population size of an invasive species, the control costs increase as well. So classic management <coughs> wants to try and stay around this early part where we can control the species either by preventing it from getting in or at an early level of establishment. So when we classically think about what prevention is in a lake, usually it's about both sewer programs and stopping lakes, or stopping invasive species from arriving at them. However, we know there's, there's a little bit more to this. You know, prevention can also be preventing a species be, from becoming established in a lake. There's plenty of lake associations that probably that don't know that they have invasive species in the lake because they're either at a low detection number where they don't see them, and they don't, most importantly for them, they don't impede them recreationally. So I would argue that it's, mo it's just as important to understand the risk of establishment along with the risk of invasion. You know, you could have 15 invasive species in a lake, but if we're not doing anything, lake, lake associations are very happy with that. Um, so there's kind of two different questions you have to ask through two different lenses. Um, for the risk of invasion, it's the geographic proximity of potential invaders to Brant Lake, and then the habitat, uh, for the risk of establishment, the habitat suitability quality. So where are they located next to Brent Lake, and can they actually, do they have the potential to, to create a nuisance population? And then both of these are integrated with preventative measures. So to give you an introduction on the lake I work on, this is Brent Lake. It is a uh, 584 hectare lake located, located in the southeastern portion of the Adirondack Lake, um, sandwiched right between Lake George and Scroon Lake and Lake uh, Champlain right at the uh, right at the north of that map. Um, these proximities are very important. I'm going to talk about uh, why in a little bit. It has a uh, max sounding depth of 18.9 meters and a mean depth of 7.1. Um, just here's some thermal and oxygen. This is an isopleth graph from last year, <clears throat> well, from all from my whole data, so from November 2014 all the way up to uh, my last open water season. And uh, we have two, strat uh, two it's a dynamic lake, so we have two mixing events. One during the uh, fall turnover and one during um, spring mixing with inverse stratification during the winter and our traditional thermal stratification during the summer. Uh, stratification sets up around the end of May and it goes all the way through the end of October with thermoclines setting up around six to eight meters. Um, the lake is very, very anoxic. Uh, we have no oxygen at the bottom of the lake from the end of July all the way out through, even when the lake is actually thermally mixed, we still have the pockets of low, um, no oxygen. And then as in the end of September, it gets really, really severe at <coughs> always, always up to 10 meters. Now, I have to say that this data comes from one profile at the deep part of the lake, which um, I have some data from, from earlier when I started the program where I sampled at multiple occasions and seen the same um, temp, uh, pattern. So. I'm safe to say, you know, it's a decent proxy for what's going on in, in the whole lake, and this is going to be important as we talk about habitat suitability. So, for the arrival step, the kind of key question we need to ask um, when, we're, when we start to talk about managing this is where are the invasive species located in relation to the lake? So over here we have a distribution map of lakes in New York State that have invasive species that Brent does not. So currently, Brent only has Eurasian water, Mills Boyle, and Curly Ponds. The size of the circles represents 
how many different invasive species are in this one lake. So it's kind of a proxy of, all right, where are the hulls? Um, a lot of this information really isn't, you know, groundbreaking. We know on the Finger Lakes and Oneida Lake and the Great Lakes as well, um, Lake George and Lake Champlain have a bunch. And we know we have some in Long Island. Uh, that's mostly a fan wart and parrot feather. A lot of species, you know, some species we see up in the northern area, but not nothing we have seen in a lot um, in a lot of different lakes. And a lot of these hubs are along interstates I-87 and I-90, which you know implies both. Boat, a boat vector being very uh, <clears throat> being one of the main reasons why these things are moving, but not the only reason. So the next question we had is, all right, we know where these invasive species are, but now which invasive species are closest to Brant Lake? So on the x-axis, we have um, some of the species we use in our distribution map. And on the y-axis, we have cool distance in miles from Brant Lake. So well, as you can see here, Spiny water fleet is 63, and on average, lakes that have spiny water fleet are 63 miles away from Brant Lake compared to every other one, which starts around 135 and goes all the way up to, you know, over 250. So really, spiny water fleet seems to be the closest invasive species to Brant Lake as far as proximity. Um, when we look at actually the spiny water fleet's distribution throughout the state, um, we can see most of that 63 is coming from the Great Sakandaga area, the Seco, Pack Lake, um, Stewartsbury Reservoir, uh, Pleasant and Lake Pleasant, and also we have populations in Lake George, Lake Champlain, and in um, Lake Ontario. Now, I want to take a second to speak about this species because as far as for prevention, this is probably the hardest species to prevent moving from one water body to the other, or detecting its establishment. It's a small body AIS, it's life history and phenology, it pops up sometimes, it has resting egg stages, it doesn't really get detected in normal monitoring. It's so hard to detect, I had a Yuri population that just didn't show up there. So it, it didn't even get detected by GIS. And I have a, <clears throat> there's a couple other ones that didn't pop up there either. But I wouldn't be surprised if this species is in quadruple the lakes that we know it's in, uh, just because of those, those reasons. So it really causes a problem. The other thing is that it's spreading rapidly. Um, Great Sockeye Dive was introduced in 2008, 2012 to Lake George, and then 2014 into Lake Champlain. Um, moving fast, hard to detect, maybe something we really need to focus on from either an educational campaign or on the prevention side. So going back to the invasion curve, um, we know we're not just managing at the arrival step, we also have to manage at the survival step. So at the survival step, the key question we want to ask is, does Brent Lake contain suitable habitat for selected invasive species? Because it's only 15 minute talk, I'm only going to speak about two of them. One species where I think that probably won't cause a problem in the future, and one that if, if introduced probably will cause a problem. So um, we're going to talk about zebra mussels for the first, because we all love zebra mussels. Um, we know calcium can be a limiting factor for them for them establishing their lake uh, for their uh, for their shell growth. Um, I have two limits here: one limit for growth and one limit for reproduction. Oftentimes, when you see cal um, zero muscle calcium discussed, you only kind of see one number, which is just a limit. And that and the problem is that that's what lake associations get, you know. So they come back and say, "Oh, the lake has 15 micrograms per liter. It's a limit for zero muscle getting it." Well, what's the limit? Is it for them growing or for reproduction? So Brant Lake's calcium, surface calcium concentrations fall right on the limit for growth. So what I think is going to happen is that if 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 your muscles are introduced into Brant Lake, the individuals might be able to exhibit some positive growth, but could they actually have could they actually reproduce and produce chocophores and have them develop into a sustaining population where we can see ecological harm? I'm not too convinced of that at this moment. Um, so we're going to talk about L life now. Um, on the x-axis, we have our open water season dates. On the y-axis, we have the percent of lake volume that is hab that can be suitable for both of these species. Um, alewife are not in the lake yet, but rainbow small are. We know in other systems they are competitors of each other, uh, for each other. So what we did is we took correct, um, upper limits of temperature and lower limits of dissolved oxygen criteria, extrapolated out those isoplith graphs you saw before to um, kind of See, to get at or which might have more habitat if they get in. Um, and as you can see, in the beginning of the year when we still have our isothermal events, and even towards where we start forming stratification, um, both of them have um, good thermal and oxygen habitat. But as we go on, and as temperatures in the surface waters increase and dissolved oxygen decreases, we have obviously a squeeze. And <coughs> alewife have much, much more available habitat than rainbow smell. So this can infer that Maybe if alewife get in, they could really have a strong competitive advantage. Also, Brant Lake lacks a lot of top predators 
that might be able to keep antelope populations in. There's no walleye, there's no large cell, large salmonids in, in the pelagic zone that might be able to exert some predation pressure. So this is a piece that I'm particularly worried about getting into Brand Lake. So preventing the, preventing the invasion. Um, really, the boat tour program is where you know it kind of starts and ends with this. You know, that's the first and last line of defense when it comes to stopping a species from arriving. <coughs> so for strengthening the program, um, we need to provide better boat launch time coverage at Brant Lake. Brant Lake currently only covers from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we know boats don't come at those exact times. We know the fishermen are coming earlier, and the fishermen are also leaving later. Um, also, I would like to equip the boat stewards with the invasive species distribution. So those early maps, I would like to give those to the stewards, because I believe it will be a very, very strong educational tool, educational tool that they can use for an incoming angler. You know, a steward can come in, and an angler can come in from Canada regularly. And the steward has no idea what's in Canada Regal. Lake. Um, you know, why should they? But if you can give them the idea that, all right, Canada Regal Lake has zebra mussels, has starry stonewort, has elo, if you can relay that message to the angler and say, hey, did you know about these species? Did you know that this was going to be, um, <clears throat> and this isn't really, did you know that these are the impacts? It also can help tailor inspections towards some of this stuff. So if you're a small body at S, you know, the stewards really need to be on their game and really need to be checking all these areas really, um, really uh, well. Also, um, if you build this into the iPad that's already used for data collecting by the boat stewards, this could really, um, there'll be a lot more streamlined process. I don't think any steward wants to have a seven page Excel table that they have to look through while trying to engage a, uh, an angler. You know, the angler's just gonna get more pissed off and say, hey, I wanna go for some lake, leave me alone. Um, and also the increased use of decontamination stations. Uh, there's new stations at Screen Lake and obviously the mandatory boat wash program at Lake George, which are in very close proximity, as well as uh, Brant Lake, or the town of Horicon for Brant Lake is looking into getting their own. So we have strong decontamination around. So there are some positives when it comes to the future for preventing species. But as with any program, there are pitfalls. And a lot of them I touched on before, but I'm gonna touch on them again. Um, there's not enough full-day coverage to catch all boaters. Not all boaters use the public launch. People launch privately. Um, not all boats are checked thoroughly. Not all invasive species enter the lake through boats. We know that's, that might be one of the major factors, but that's not the only factor. And uh, not all decontamination is 100% effective. I know Eric's going to expand on some um, alternate decontamination strategies. So how do we get around this? You know, we have this one wall we build, we build up around the lake. But if a species gets in, what do we do after that? That's why I believe we need the integration for early detection on some of these smaller lakes. Um, and that's why I'm gonna bring up Brant Lake's battle, Brant Lake's battle with milfoil. It was first found in the lake in 1987, and since then they've been, har they've been dealing with it using a combination of hand harvesting and putting benthic mats down. Um, Aquatic and Basic Management, which is a contracting company out of Paul Smith's, has taken over the harvesting uh, since 2008. And recently, they put a shoreline monitoring program to kind of detect the milfoil. So basically, what they do is the lake association themselves, these are volunteers, they section down the lake, and each of these sections has a volunteer that goes out during the summer season um, at, at various intervals, and they go look for milfoil. Either they go view it from the um, <clears throat> view it from the surface, or they view it through a viewing tube, um, or they have, they actually want to see through kayak so they view, they can see the milfoil through there. The point is that you have all these people on the lake looking already, plus the divers, which in their job, they're already diving around the lake, constantly scuba diving, you know, four to six weeks a year, getting good lake coverage. You have a real strong potential to actually look for other things besides no form when it comes in. And most importantly, look for them when they're at that lower abundance. So then, if you detect them, we can actually come with some um, rapid response uh, protocols. So, the big picture. Brant Lake is at high risk for potential invasive species introduction because it has a, a high proximity to infested lakes and a proximity to major interstates which might be car uh, carrying some of these species. Habitat characteristics potentially favor some species but not others. More work needs to be done into this but it kind of gives us a starting point to say, all right, where can we focus our efforts? Um, especially for early detection because with prevention, um, boat steward um, plans can cover a lot of that stuff but for early detection, we know with different species phenologies, Different detection is different detection strategies might be needed, uh, especially when it comes to something like spotted water feed. Uh, with combined use of the aim divers and shoreline monitor program, plus some other uh, early detection stuff I'm proposing, we're thinking about doing a, a brick a day program. Lake George did it where they had um, stakeholders just take a brick and tie it to a buoy and 
set it down, and then uh, picked it up and see if there's any zebra mussels on there. It's quick, easy, inexpensive. It gets the public engaged in the program, and uh, it, it can actually get some pretty good information. Uh, like I said, um, I, can't, I can't harp on this enough. Integration with prevention is critical. Many of these like associations that don't have the benefit of a strong, you know, a university working on them, or one of our students working on them, or backed by you know either state monitoring or some other agency, they're kind of left, you know, they're kind of left in the dust when it comes to early detection. Um, so can we come up with some cost-effective ways using something like a great program or integrating management already that's having a one invasive species to kind of use it in a, a different context? So I would like to thank everyone that helped me out with this uh, pro with this project. And I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, AJ.